So we've talked about the plant life cycle. The uh, <clears throat> sporophyte generation makes spores via meiosis. Spores are cells that can grow into a gametophyte. Gametophytes are a haploid organism that produce gametes by mitosis. And when they fertilize one another, they make a zygote that grows into an embryo that becomes the next sporophyte. Spores are produced in structures called sporangia. And gametophytes uh, can be big, I mean kind of big in the case of mosses, the big green leafy thing. Or in the case of ferns and some other plants that we'll look at later, they're smaller. Um, here we see, uh, actually if you look down here, this little dark spot right there, that's part of the spore still stuck to this gametophyte uh, of a fern. This is a fern gametophyte. Notice how small it is. The scale bar is only one millimeter. So this whole thing is a couple millimeters wide. Not very big at all. All right, so that brings us to vascular plants. Vascular plants are those that have uh, vascular tissues. And in vascular plants, the sporophyte is the big long-lived part. Uh, the gametophyte is small. Um, and it gets smaller as we move up the cladogram of plants. And in ferns, it's free living, meaning it's photosynthetic. But in seed plants, um, gametophytes are not free living. They don't photosynthesize. They're really tiny. They're completely dependent upon the sporophyte for nutrition. They have complex organs, uh, including vascular tissue, roots, and leaves. We don't see true roots and leaves in the mosses. Um, here's an early example of, uh, from the fossil record of Cooksonia, a really early vascular plant. You can just see it has this uh, dichotomously branching stem with sporangia on the tips where the spores were produced. So vascular tissue uh, includes xylem, which, is our, which are cells strengthened by lignin. You can see these spiral thickenings, these different kinds of wall thickenings. These are extra thick cell walls is what that red stuff is. And that gives them strength. They conduct water. Um, they act like a big drinking straw. And phloem has thinner cells that are alive at maturity, unlike xylem, and they transport sugars and hormones. Roots, of course, their major jobs are to hold the plant down and to absorb water and minerals, whereas the leaves are photosynthesis factories. They, they make sugars for the plant. But a lot of times in, in different plants, the leaves are also, at least some of the leaves anyway, are sporophylls, meaning that the leaves produce the sporangia for, re, for, for reproduction. They produce those sporangia that make those spores. So ferns, for example, have sporangia on the bottom of their leaves. So in the Paleozoic era, um, a lot of these uh, seedless vascular plants were dominant. These are all different trees and different things that, that uh, produce spores but did not make seeds. So they have vascular tissue, they make spores, they're, they're ferns and fern-like plants, but they don't make seeds. And there are living examples of these today, uh, ferns, horsetail, uh, for example, you can see some of this growing behind the greenhouse on campus, and I'm sure you're familiar with these. And then there are other examples I won't go into today, like this one, uh, which is related to ferns as well. Um, here we see sporophylls. These are fern leaves with sporangia on the bottom. See these, these circles? Each one of these big circles, the circle is called a sorus, and each one has uh, probably like 60 or more sporangia in it. So there are tons of sporangia in each of these sores, and then each sporangium makes a bunch of spores by meiosis. Here's another example of the bottom of a fern leaf. In this case, the, uh, the sporangia have a protective covering over them that protect them from the environment. That's why they look a little different than over here. So um, fern sp uh, sporangia look like this. So if we were to zoom in on one of these yellow circles and look at one of these little blobs, it would look like this. So what we have here is a structure where meiosis takes place, spores are made, and there's this thing on top that looks kind of like a worm, doesn't it? Um, that, I'm going to try to write with my uh, mouse, I don't have my pen plugged in. Um, that little weird structure right there uh, is called an annulus, A-N-N-Annulus. And what it does is, is when it dries out, when these cells dry out, the sidewalls here are thicker 
than the top wall. So these top walls suck in when this thing dries out. And that causes that whole thing to crack open like it collapses like an accordion and it causes the whole sporangium to crack open like we see in this picture here. And it cocks back and then it actually flings forward and it throws the spores out into the environment. Uh, these spores, once again, are covered with sporopollenin. It's a protective coating, and that protective coating is really resilient. In fact, uh, this spore here, here's a spore you can see. Uh, that's a spore from the Cretaceous period, the time of the dinosaurs. It's not alive anymore, but you can still see that, uh, oops, that uh, sporopollenin layer. Um, this is from a fossil I described in grad school. And notice how it has this this weird uh, triangle shape on it. We call this a trilete mark. The reason that it has that is there used to be another spore attached here, another attached here, another attached here, making four total spores. Remember what happens in my meiosis? You start with a cell, it undergoes meiosis one, then it undergoes meiosis two, making four total cells. Well, these four spores were made by meiosis and they were all stuck together before they broke apart and they left a little scar on each other uh, because of that connection. Okay, so you can, um, we haven't talked about seed plants yet, that'll be the next part of the chapter, but you can start making a, um, a data matrix of these things to figure out how these organisms are related. So chlorophyll A and B, uh, yeah, that's found in, in uh, algae, that's found in moss, that's found in fern, that's found in all of these plants. One, two, three, four, five, five, you know. Protected embryo, nope, not found in there, but it is found in these, okay? And so you can go through and fill this table out. Uh, I have it done, done here, uh, you can check your work. Uh, but remember, if you don't do it yourself first without looking at this, so back up the video, uh, it won't do you any good as a learning tool. And then what you could do is you can make a cladogram of these different groups quite easily using the data matrix. So we're going to uh, go from here into seed plants soon. So we, we talked about mosses, which are gametophyte dominant. We talked about ferns, which are sporophyte dominant, but ferns have vascular tissue. They have roots. Um, uh, the, the sporophytes have roots, whereas mosses don't have roots. Um, and the, the green part you see in a fern, the big green thing, is diploid. It's the sporophyte. And in all the rest of the plants we'll look at, the seed plants, the big green thing you see, or the big tree that you see outside, that is a sporophyte. It's a diploid organism. Whereas in mosses, that green thing you see is a gametophyte. And one thing I forgot to mention, and I'm going to mention it now, you got to write it down. An, uh, Ferns have vascular tissue, uh, but they still have swimming sperm. Their sperm have flagella, so they still need a moist environment to get the sperm to the egg. Okay, I failed to mention that earlier, just thought of it. Ferns have swimming sperm, so they are still somewhat tied to the water. Kind of like an amphibian, still tied to the water, right? So we're going to pick up from that next time. We're going to start looking at seed plants the uh, gymnosperms and the angiosperms. And then after that, we'll move into animal diversity uh, for the next chapter.